that if not always gotten a commensurate level of attention to the pro-life stuff that he wants to lift up, and, and they traditionally fall under the heading of what they call the social gospel. So, you know, concern for the poor, concern for the environment, opposition to war, social justice issues, okay? Proof of the point would be the three highest profile and gutsiest political interventions we have seen from Francis over his first year in office were all devoted to some element of the social gospel. Okay. One, his July 8th trip to Lampedusa. This was his first trip outside of Rome. Okay. He decided to devote it to a trip to Lampedusa that is an island in the southern Mediterranean that is the major point of arrival for impoverished migrants and refugees from Africa and the Middle East who were trying to get into Europe. Typically what happens is these people spend like two years or 18 months trying to make their way up to the coast of either Libya or Tunisia. They typically get horribly exploited along the way. Some of them are sold into human slavery and so on. When they get to the coast, they have to cough up whatever meager cash is left in their pocket to book passage in one of these rickety, illegal, overcrowded, and horribly unsafe boats. Over the last two decades alone, 20,000 people have perished in the Mediterranean trying to make their way across. If they do get across, they end up in one of these detention centers, and then they try to apply for refugee status, and meanwhile, they're warehoused for a couple of years. Well, in any event, uh, on the 8th of July, Francis went to Lampedusa to lay a wreath in the sea to commemorate uh, those 20,000 people who have died, uh, to call for greater compassion with regard to immigration, uh, and to blast what he called a globalization of indifference with regard to immigrants. Now, why was this a gutsy move? Well, in this respect, the politics of Italy are no different than the politics of the United States. Abortion, I'm sorry, immigration is a tremendously divisive third rail political issue, okay? And for the new patriarch of Italy, the new leader of the Italian Catholic Church to make his political debut on his own soil, a political statement that he knew was going to rub probably half of his flock the wrong way, uh, was in context a fairly bold thing to do. All right. Second high profile political intervention was in Brazil on the 25th of July. Francis visited uh, what the Brazilians call a favela, that's their word for a slum. Uh, it's a place called Virginia, which is known as the uh, Rio, it's known as the Gaza Strip uh, of Rio de Janeiro because it's been the site of bloody clashes between the police and the drug gangs and so on. About a year before, the Brazilians had rolled in a foul mix of armored personnel carriers. They had basically burned the place to the ground. Uh, and having done that, they claimed that they had brought peace. Okay? Now, Francis stood in that space that day, wagging his finger and said, no pacification campaign, no attempt to bring peace will ever be lasting, nor will it be real until it reckons with the fact that too many people in this society are kicked to the margins and cut out of the new circles of opportunity being created. Now, why was that a bold move? Well, again, I, I've covered uh, uh, almost 100 papal trips over the years. I will tell you this, popes are notoriously reluctant to do or say anything that is going to be construed as political criticism of their popes. They don't like to embarrass the people who were rolling out the red carpet for them. But obviously, Francis felt that something important enough was at stake that day that he was willing to rupture that informal taboo. Okay. And then finally, of course, the, the, the third high-profile political intervention would be uh, his strong press in early September against the idea uh, of Western military intervention in Syria. Right? You will remember in early, in early September that the drums of war were beating in Washington and in London and in Paris. It looked like the major Western powers were on the brink of going to war in Syria to try to bring down the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Francis launched a full court diplomatic press against that. He summoned all of the ambassadors accredited into the Vatican for a day-long briefing by his diplomatic brain trust to make the case against the war. He sent out anti-war messages uh, in every forum available to him. And on the 7th of September, he called a global day of prayer and fasting for all the 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, including himself presiding over an incredibly evocative penitential service uh, in St. Peter's Square. Summing up, the three high-profile political interventions we saw from Francis over his first 15 months were a pro-immigrant statement, a statement of solidarity with the poor, 
and an anti-war state. That's the social gospel in action, and I believe it is going to continue to be the kind of social agenda we see on this Pope's watch, not as an alternative to our pro-life advocacy, but as an organic complement to it. Okay? Finally, Francis and Mercy. Look, uh, in my business, which is the media business, we are at forever, and you all know this, we are forever in search of the defining soundbite about public figures, right? That one line that kind of sums up who they are. Now, by this point in my career, I've covered three popes. I've covered John Paul II, I've covered Benedict XVI, I've covered Francis. These are all complex men, and they simply cannot be reduced to handy-dandy little one-liners, okay? That said, however, there was in each case a kind of famous phrase associated with each of these popes that kind of sums up a great deal uh, of what they were about. I think with John Paul II, uh, there was no doubt what that one liner was. It was, be not afraid. Be not afraid. I mean, John Paul II, as you know, uh, in some ways our memories of him are clouded by the way he died that long twilight at the end, but you kind of have to play the reel back in your mind to October 1978, when this swashbuckling man's man, kind of Polish John Wayne in a cassock, you know, burst upon the world stage with this ambition uh, of kind of, you know, inviting the Catholic Church to recapture his verb uh, and, and to become relevant once again. And, and you know, we, we certainly saw that uh, in the role he played in the collapse of communism and all of that. All right, with Benedict XVI, again, I think there is no doubt what that signature phrase was. Uh, it was reason and faith. That was the heart of the argument Benedict was trying to make to a world over eight very difficult years that human reason and religious faith need one another, that faith shorn of reason becomes nihilism and skepticism, uh, reason, uh, I'm sorry, that reason shorn of faith becomes nihilism and skepticism, faith shorn of reason becomes extremism and fundamentalism, that to be healthy, these two things need one another. Now look, it's early in the game with Francis, but I think we already know what his signature phrase is. It's something he has said over and over and over again since his election, so often that it probably ought to be printed on t-shirts, you know, as like the epigrammatic synthesis of what he's trying to get across. And the line is, the Lord never tires of forgiving. The Lord never tires of forgiving. And sometimes he adds, it is us who get tired of asking for forgiveness. Fundamentally, it is a statement about mercy. Mercy, ladies and gentlemen, is quite literally this Pope's motto. His motto is Pope, is the same motto he had as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a line that comes from the Venerable Bede. It's kind of a complicated Latin formula, but, but basically Bede is writing on the Gospel scene of the call of Matthew, and he says that Jesus saw Matthew through the eyes of mercy and chose him. So choosing through the eyes of mercy is therefore this Pope's motto. Mercy is also in this Pope's action. You know, Popes are also uh, bishops of Rome, and one of the things they try to do as the Bishop of Rome is get around and visit as many Roman parishes as they possibly can. Francis so far has made six parish visits. Uh, his first was on the 26th of May. He went out to a parish called St. Elizabeth and Zechariah, which is in a working class neighborhood of Rome called Avery. Uh, the Pope was supposed to get there that morning at 10.30. Okay, papal helicopter lands at about 9.45, okay? So once the pastor gets done defibrillating his heart, right, and he sort of, you know, gets his blood moving again, he runs out to the parking lot where the helicopter has landed. And Francis pops out and says, hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry for the early start, but uh, in addition to saying mass and chatting with the folks, uh, I would also like to hear a few confessions. Now, you've got to understand, this was not part of the program, right? So the pastor runs, and he grabs eight people, basically at random, and says to them, you're going to confession. Okay? Now, this pastor, he's a Romanian immigrant. His name is Father Bayoni Ambris. So he told me the story. It's kind of cute. He said these people looked at him, and they said, well, I mean, Father, that's very sweet, but, you know, we're actually here to see the Pope. To which he said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, come with me. Okay, and he lined them up in front of the confessional, and one by one, Francis sat there, heard their sins, and administered God's forgiveness. Now again, 
In part, this was just him wanting to be a good local bishop. But in part, remember the savvy Jesuit politician. It was important to him that the world see the Pope making a point out of celebrating the church's premier right of mercy. Again, this is not a journalistic hypothesis. On that plane flight on the 28th of July, during that impromptu press conference, one of the questions we asked Francis was about divorced and remarried Catholics, and he gave us an answer, but then he said, I would like to make a bigger point. And he said, the bigger point is, I believe we are living in a kairos of mercy. A kairos of mercy. Using that evocative Greek New Testament term, which means a privileged moment in God's plan of salvation. Okay, this is a pope who believes his papacy, believes this moment in time to be a moment ordained by God for the message of mercy. I am profoundly convinced that everything that Francis is doing, from the nitty-gritty details of how to reorganize the Vatican Bank on up to, you know, pastoral policy and divorced and remarried Catholics and beyond, all of it, fundamentally, is predicated on the ambition that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, what they will see is a community of mercy. Community that doesn't just pay lip service to mercy, but genuinely practices it in its day-to-day -day life. Now look, I mean, Francis is no naive. He knows that as a minister of the Christian gospel, he is obligated to do two things with regard to the fallen world. He has to pronounce both God's judgment and God's mercy. Okay, one without the other would be a falsification. But I think his calculus is that the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity. And now it is time for the world to hear and to see and to feel and to smell and to taste our mercy. Look, we have come up, we in the media trade have come up with all kinds of, of cute monikers for the new pope. We call them the people's pope, the pope of the poor, the maverick pope, the pope of first, the pope of surprises, all of that. And all of them capture something. But my prediction, and I know none of you have asked for this, but I am infamous for answering questions I've never been asked, so here's one. My prediction as of today is that when the final word on this papacy is written, we are going to remember Francis as the Pope of Mercy. Pope of Mercy. Get that about this Pope, and you will be a long way down the road to understanding where he's coming from. Okay. We end with one final thought about reaction to Francis, uh, and then we'll take our break. Despite what I said at the top about Francis's phenomenal poll numbers, uh, you know, nobody who plays on a big global stage uh, ever draws completely, unanimously positive reviews. Okay? And I'm sure it is no accident, it is no surprise to anyone uh, gathered in this uh, church here tonight to hear uh, that not everyone is just doing cartwheels with enthusiasm uh, about what they are seeing and hearing from the new pope. Now, uh, we media types like to understand that reaction in terms of left v. right, and the usual way we frame this uh, is that it's the liberals who are thrilled and the conservatives who are fighting down partner. Okay? I'm not 100% 100% sure that's true today, and I'm really not sure it's going to be true over the long term. I tend to prefer to think in terms of gospel categories. I, I did a column recently in which I suggested that Pope Francis has an older son problem. You know, using language from the parable of the, of the prodigal son. Right. I would say that over the first year or so of his papacy, he's done a phenomenal job reaching out to the prodigal daughters and sons of the postmodern world, both inside and outside the church. But I do think there are a few older sons in the church who feel like they've been carrying water for the church for a very long time, who frankly are feeling a little left out of the party. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could go on ticking off these categories. I mean, I, I can guarantee you one place where you can find some of these older sons would be Vatican personnel, uh, you know, who feel that they've been, many of them feel that they have been doing loyal service to the successor of Peter for their entire adult lives, and frankly are a little tired of reading the latest interview where the Pope is taking potshots at them. 